Welcome to Sports Spectrum, the sports and faith podcast that brings Jesus back into the conversation. Here's your host, Jason Romano. This episode of the Sports Spectrum podcast with former National League Cy Young Award winner R.A. Dickey is brought to you in part by Compassion International, $38 a month. And it goes to sponsor a child in Jesus' name. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. This is your opportunity to make a difference in a child's life, directly impacting a child and giving something that every child deserves. And it's simply hope. And what you do is when you sponsor a child, you provide them with food, education, training, everything that a child should have. That's what you do when you sponsor through Compassion International. Simply go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. There's a, a list of children on there. Pray about it. Talk to your, to your family about it. And then sponsor your child. Pick the child and you sponsor them $38 a month and you make a child's uh, life change uh, in a second by you sponsoring them. So you can go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum and sponsor a child today. I promise you, you will not regret it. The best $38 you will spend every month is with Compassion International. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum, sponsor a child today. Today's guest on the podcast is the 2012 National League Cy Young Award winner, former Major League Baseball pitcher R.A. Dickey joins us here on the podcast. Now, R.A. was an all-star in that 2012 season, as well as the National League strikeout leader. He won 20 games, 2.73 ERA, 230 strikeouts from a knuckleball pitcher, and he won the National League Cy Young Award with the New York Mets. R.A. pitched in 2001. That's when he made his Major League Baseball debut and then came back in 2003 to 2006 with the Texas Rangers and then went over to Seattle in 08, Minnesota in 09, and then the New York Mets from 2010 to 2012. He was traded to Toronto and pitched from 2013 to 2016 there and then finished out his Major League career last year with the Atlanta Braves in 2017. In 2012, he also penned his autobiography, Wherever I Wind Up, My Quest for Truth, Authenticity, and the Perfect Knuckleball. R.A. also won a gold glove in 2013, and at 40 years of age in 2015, Dickey became the oldest player in Major League Baseball history to make his postseason debut. That's right, postseason debut at the age of 40. And on this episode of the podcast, of course, we're going to talk about baseball and R.A. adjusting to life after baseball and what that's been like in 2018 for him, his first year without playing baseball in a very long time. But in his autobiography, he opened up and talked a lot about sexual abuse that he uh, was a victim of and also some of the other struggles that he's went through to the point of infidelity, to the point of almost wanting to end his life. Uh, and then God saved him along with a bunch of other really amazing moments and people that were put into his life. And this is about as deep a podcast as I can remember doing uh, with an athlete, certainly. And R.A. is so authentic and so genuine and so transparent in the struggles that he went through and kind of where that brought him and kind of to where he is now, where he's able to impact people by telling others about Jesus and about his story. So it's really a, a fun conversation, a deep conversation, and a very impactful, I think, conversation with former Major League Baseball pitcher R.A. Dickey. Let's take a listen here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. R.A., welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. It's great to talk to you. Now we're taping this in the summertime, late July. First time in a long time that you haven't pitched in a baseball game or been a part of a baseball team here in 2018. How has this year been going for you without baseball for the first time? You know, and I think in all honesty, it, it started kind of rough uh, because when you've done something for 21 years of your life um, professionally and then another, you know, six or seven as an amateur, you know, you're never home in the spring and summer. So you really don't know the rhythm of what that's like, uh, and, you know, put on top of that being married and, and, you know, your wife being the boss while you're gone the whole time and you get home and want to input. <laughs> it's, uh, oh, yeah. there's a, there's a, a rhythm to that, that, um, I'm learning and has taken some time to, to really, uh, kind of come full circle. So 
it's been challenging in that regard, but also because the first couple months, you know, I, I really, I, I felt like it was the right timing to walk away. But, you know, in all honesty, I still was felt like I was good enough to play and and uh, had offers on the table that I could have taken. And so to to try to be uh, you know, to try to be obedient to the conviction that I was feeling was very difficult. What's been the best part and the hardest part, I guess, to uh, not be a baseball player and be a part of a team this year? Well, you know what? The best the best part, uh, and this will come as no surprise to our, the listeners, I'm sure, but just getting to pour into my family. You know, they've, they've sacrificed quite a bit to allow me to play for so long, especially my wife and uh, my kids. I've missed you know, up teen hundred, you know, recitals and games and yeah. special moments for them. So for me, like just being around, being available, getting to pour into them, uh, the way I feel like a father should be able to do consistently, uh, has been a real blessing. Um, and then the hardest part, um, has probably been just, uh, the competitive component for me, uh, has been really difficult. You know, I, I, I've grown up a really loving competition and, and, um, still feel physically able. And so to try to hold that against the other is kind of the challenge for me. And, and, you know, the, the, the rhythm part to how to do family life and, and kind of re-domesticate, if you will, into, uh, everyday life away from baseball has been a, a, a challenge, but it's been a, a fun challenge to try to try to figure out how to do that better. What about church? I know obviously as a baseball player, you have an off season where maybe you can get acclimated into a church, but during the season, it's obviously very difficult. What about that component with your family now and having the time to kind of do that? Yeah, I think it's just, uh, you know, a consistency, uh, thing for me, like getting, I would, I would sometimes, um, on the road, find a church and, and we always had baseball chapel, which was an incredible uh, blessing to get to have my whole career. But, you know, there's nothing that replaces getting in the car and talking about life and driving to church and hearing a message and then going to lunch with your family. And to get to do that uh, has been a real treat as well. It's just, a, it's you know, it's that time spent and time spent doing something worthwhile that, that has really um, invigorated me. Um, as a, as a father and husband. Are you officially retired? Can you, can we say that or not officially yet? You know, I, I could tell everybody I'm unofficially retired, um, simply because in order to officially retire, you have to file papers with M the MLB and MLBPA. And, um, I don't know if I'll ever do that. Um, and who, who knows, you know, also as a knuckleballer, um, you know, I might go back at 48 or 49. You never know. <laughs> you never know what God has planned, right? We're talking to R.A. Dickey here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Your journey to the big leagues, by the way, for those listening that don't know it, you know, you want to Cy Young and, and maybe more people know about the more recent part of your success in baseball. But there's so many obstacles and twists and turns, and you chronicle a lot of them in your autobiography from, from 2012, wherever I wind up. I'd like to go back a little bit about growing up. I know you had a difficult childhood. Can you share a little with our audience about some of the things that you went through? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, I, I was, uh, and I grew up. I grew up uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, and and my parents got married very early in life and ended up getting divorced when I was eight. Um, and they were, they were, they were kind of separated before then, but they officially got divorced when I was eight. And that eight year old year for me, uh, which was 1980, I mean, I'm sorry, 1982 was a really difficult year because I had, um, also been sexually abused. And, um, that, that was the beginning for me of a really kind of toxic development, uh, internally. And, uh, never really recovered from that. Um, and, and that, you know, after doing a lot of work with, uh, pastor, a pastor and, and a counselor, uh, I've, I've come to the realization that, you know, I, I probably will never fully get over that and that's okay. And how to hold that well has been a real challenge for me. Um, 
but anyway, that, that led to a lot of poor decisions as a, you know, as a young adult and even as a husband, you know, just trying to figure out how to do that part. Well, I've never had that modeled for me. So didn't really know how to, how to treat my wife or be a good father. And, and I'm still learning all those things. Don't get me wrong. But in that moment I was in a real unhealthy way. Um, mm. you know, just, just not happy with myself in a whole lot of ways. And so, um, you know, in 2005, I was, what was I, 31 years old. I was seeing the end of my career, you know, where I haven't really achieved very much. My whole identity probably was tied up in who I was as a baseball player. And, you know, I felt my marriage wasn't, wasn't good. And, you know, I, a lot of things were kind of coming down on top of me. And I just, you know, I wanted to end it really. Um, and it was very difficult because, uh, there was always this conflict because I'd become a, a believer at 13, but I, I hadn't really cultivated that belief very much. I was, I certainly believe in Jesus and that he was who he said he was. And, and that was the foundation that I always bounced off of no matter what decisions I made or how shame filled I felt or how guilty I felt or how sad and lonely and angry I felt that that was the foundation always bounced off of so um that was kind of the the breaking point for me and I came to the end of myself in 05 and and turned to a a a counselor who's now a friend I talk about him in the book a lot in our relationship and how how that really helped me but it's a little bit about my journey in a nutshell so many people have experienced broken homes. I came from a broken home. Many, unfortunately, have been the victim of abuse, whether it's physical or mental or, or sexual. How long did it take you before you, you told someone about these experiences? Because as men, you know, we like to hold things in. And I think sometimes, you know, that's just kind of how men are wired. How long did it take for you to finally, you know, maybe even just talk about it or tell someone about it? Well, you know. Um, I was, like I said, I was 31. It happened when I was eight. Yeah. And so, so, you know, that's 23 years, right. Uh, of keeping that a secret and trying to hide from the truth of things. And, you know, I was married to my wife when I was, um, how old was I? I was 20, 23. And so, you know, for the first eight years of our marriage, it was, I was, you know, someone that she really didn't know intimately because I'd never shared with her my deepest, darkest stuff. And Mm. that was, that was a mistake for me. Um, I know in reflection, uh, but you know, when you grow up with, with sexual abuse, you, the moment that happens, you feel like your your growth is stunted, and so I was still an eight year old boy at age thirty one. You know, like I I didn't know how to do relationship. I didn't trust anybody. I didn't want to be close to anybody. I was really good at pretending and being able to compartmentalize things in order to get things done. But I was I was broken and lonely and and very uh, dissatisfied with life and. You know, I would blame other people for things. And, you know, I just I didn't I just really didn't know how to live fully. I just was surviving. And uh, to answer your question, that's the way I lived for 23 years, um, which is a long time. That's enough time for things to become uh, almost fossilized if you don't get the chisel out and start breaking them up and. Thankfully, I had a lot of people who loved me well come alongside me once I decided to to uh, tell the truth about my life, um, and that that saved me. You also mentioned, you know, pastors and counselors and other people who were able to help you. I think a lot of people look at who, especially people maybe in sports and that machismo. You know, we're men. We're you know we're tough. Uh, uh, look yeah. at and they look at counseling as a weakness, you know, reaching out for help as a weakness, share with our audience and why that isn't the case and why, and why counseling was so vital 
uh, to your, you know, mental and spiritual health? Well, that's a great question and a very good insight. And I would, I'll be the first to admit that I was in that camp previous to um, kind of my, my, my moment, my, my end of myself moment. Yeah. Uh, you know, I always kind of looked uh, at counseling as a crutch and, you know, I had all the answers and, you know, and that's, uh, that's just, for me, it was a product of being uneducated about it. And also the product of the enemy knowing how he could attack me in a way that made me think I had all the answers. Uh, you know, I, one thing that baseball did for me and sports in general, because I was fairly good at, um, football, basketball, and baseball are the sports I played in high school as an amateur and going up and I was pretty good at all of them. And it, it gives you this, this validation that, you know, you've got it all figured out and, you know, you're something special and, uh, you know, other people don't have what you do. And I, I would say that there were times and, and I've repented of this, but there were times when, you know, I felt like, I was probably better than most people I talked to, you know, that arrogance that comes with that. So being able to uh, admit that to a counselor that you, you can't do it, you can't figure it out. Like that just wasn't in my DNA. Uh, I didn't know how to do that. I didn't have the equipment to be able to do that. And it, it, it was, you know, again, the culmination of a lot of horrible things that kind of came to a climax to force me to realize and, you know, God, God yanked me by my neck and said, Hey man, you're going to live differently. Mm. Like I've got something better for you. I've started a work in you that I want to finish. And this is not it. And if I have to use baseball and the things that you love the most, your family to bring you to your knees, I'm going to do that. And, um, he did. And, um, thankfully, I had a guy in my life that was recommended to me by by someone um, that was a, a life-changing human being for me. And the thing that changed it for me, uh, Jason, was it wasn't some, you know, grand epiphany of realization in, you know, a sterile room with me laying down on the couch and, right. you know, the kind of the picture that everybody paints of, counseling and psychiatry and all that. It was simply a man sitting across from me that said, Hey man, I don't know what you've been through. And at this time I, I hadn't shared about my abuse. I hadn't shared about my struggles with uh, suicidal thoughts. I hadn't, I hadn't shared anything. I have another man sitting across from me and saying, I don't know what you've done or what you're going to tell me or what's in your heart, but you need to know that I'm, I'm never going to leave you. Hmm. And that, that was a, that was a, a moment for me. That was a moment for me. Um, because I believed him. It was authentic. You know, obviously he had, he had dealt with a lot of people in crisis and, um, I don't know if he, and I couldn't care less if he had told other people what he told me, but I believed him when he said it and it did something to me in that moment. It was like, God was speaking through him. You know, I will never leave you or forsake you. Right. I will, I will not run away from your crap. I will not be appalled. I will not be, uh, you know, whatever the word is that you want to come with, it would describe the ugliness of what uh, had been done to me and the things that I had thought about myself. They weren't going to run away from that. That was a moment for me. Hmm. And so I would, I would, you know, and I do um, always encourage people uh, to embrace uh, the risk. And it is a risk because anytime you share your heart and your stuff with another person, sure. you're risking, you're risking rejection. You're risking uh, judgment. You're risking all kinds of things that scare you to death. And I encourage people in a safe setting to, to, to risk that because of what can grow out of it. And for me, that's what happened. Uh, a relationship was forged in that moment. And, you know, I'm happy to say that, um, Stephen, who was my counselor in that moment over the course of the next, um, 
over the next we're in 2018 now yeah um golly <laughs> so from 2000 from 2005 to 2018 for the last 13 years he's you know stopped being my counselor and he's my very best friend and so that that has been a relationship for me that was a life-saving relationship so when i Whenever I say, you know, I've been the product of people who've come a lot alongside me and loved me well, he was certainly at the top of the list, you know, and there, there have been so many others, Jason. I mean, Carter Crenshaw, who is the pastor of my church um, and has been a loyal friend for so long, was instrumental in stepping in and helping encourage me to, to reach out to other people. I just, I just was never good and scared to death of doing relationship, you know, I just... I went, I, di- I didn't know how to do it and was scared of it. And, and that cost me. We're talking to R.A. Dickey here on the Sports Spectrum podcast. As you go through all of this personally and you start to heal personally, you're embarking on, embarking on this baseball journey as well. And you journey through three teams and then you arrive in New York City and Queens and pitch well with the Mets in 2010 and 2011. And then 2012, you have the season of all seasons, right? And you're the best pitcher in the National League, winning 20 games, 230 strikeouts, 2.73 ERA, a National League all-star, a Cy Young, all this with the knuckleball. It's been six years now since that amazing season. What do you think about when you when you look back at that year, look back at that season? Well, it sure was fun. I know. And one of the things that I was horrible at, Jason, for so long, and I think a lot of people who suffer from abuse or have been the product of any kind of abuse really is that, um, and this, this might be a hard thing just in general to do as a human being, but we always remember um, our, our defeats and the things that we don't do well more so than we do the things we do well. So for me, for me, learning how to celebrate things was a big stepping stone in my, my growth as a human being, I think. I had always really been good at beating myself up when I would give up six runs and, um, you know, get hit out of the third inning or whatever it was. I was real good at beating myself up about that, but I would pitch a two hitter in triple a or wherever I was trying to get back up to the big leagues. And my thoughts would turn immediately to the next start. I could never enjoy it. And so 2012 was really special because I was in a moment in my in my journey where I was working on celebrating things with, with myself and with other people. And, and the Cy Young year was special. Um, but it was, it was really a byproduct, you know, it wasn't. And, and, and when I started doing, um, work in 2006, it's not like things 2005, 2006, it's not like things, you know, automatically started to get better. Right. It was, I was, I was, still a, a hot mess and I still am a hot mess at times. I just have the equipment to be able to be self-aware enough now to, to help with that. But 2012 was, was just the byproduct of um, a, a life away from baseball that was beginning to take shape in a really brand new way. Um, I was learning to, to kind of not necessarily be just a survivor anymore. Right. I was learning how to, to be a craftsman, like to really engage um, my inner self, to really be honest with people about who I was, with my wife, working on communication. Like I was learning a work ethic in my marriage and learning a work ethic away from baseball. And then, you know, the next step for me from craftsman was how can I be an artist? How can I live free? How can I paint a picture of, of my life in a way that, uh, you know, I can smile about and, and hold open handedly and say, God, I don't know what this is. I, you know, I feel like I've got a gift and you've put me in this place. How do I, how do I pitch free? How do I live free? And that to me is a real artistry. And, and 2012 was, was kind of that, that next step of development for me as a human. It was, it was going from, from craftsman to artist and how do I, how do I let go of the game that I'd really drawn a lot of validation and from and my identity was tied up in? How do I let that go in a way that's healthy? Uh, yeah, I still love to compete. Yes, when I go in the locker room, I, I, I still love, you know, going to throw bullpens and trying to learn my craft and 
putting the work in and lifting weights and like doing that. I love all that. But I was, I was also loving trying to invest in other people's lives in the locker room and letting people into my life in the locker room in a way that I had never done before. And so the, the, the on-field stuff really became a byproduct. And from then on, you know, I mean, in years after that, I didn't win another Cy Young. I had some pretty, pretty good years, but I still efforted to live life in a, freely in a way that I had, I had uh, come to enjoy. And, you know, I never knew it really existed until I got to the bottom of myself and started my own journey, um, you know, with, with uh, Stephen, my counselor, and, and others, other men. You know, I had a small circle of friends, uh, you know, and I would encourage people to, to do this. Wherever I go speak, I would say to people and do say to people, you know, if you want to grow as a human being, it's so important for you to surround yourself with like-minded people that are safe, that you can trust. And it may be one person, it may be three people, but yes, as an accountability partner, but so much more than that, like people that can really grow with you and invite you to grow with them. Uh, because I never was good at going in with a, with somebody and just saying, okay, here's my stuff. Here's what I've struggled with. Help me with it. Like, I need to know, I need to know that you struggle with the same stuff. I need to know, maybe not the same stuff, but you struggle like that. You're like, it was important that that empathetic component for me was huge. And so to find people that were willing to do that with me as I was doing that with them was, was another uh, piece of equipment that uh, was instrumental in helping me to grow. And so 2012, the Cy Young year was great, but it was, it was simply, again, just a byproduct of me growing off the field in a lot of different ways. Well, I have to imagine, you know, having a season like that, you know, suddenly you go from being a good pitcher to being the best pitcher in the National League, that platform increases and that is an opportunity to tell others uh, about your life and certainly about God and point people back to him. Did you recognize that? Is that something that you were aware of? Yes, it was. And it was it was a miraculous event, really kind of how it all came together. Uh you know, I started writing uh, wherever I wound up um, in 2008. And in 2008, I was in Tacoma, Washington, on a craft, in a craftsman house overlooking the Puget Sound on an air mattress. Uh, because that's what, you know, as a minor league baseball player, you grow up trying to figure it out at Walmart uh, with a cot. Or, you know, my family wasn't there. I was just trying to rent houses and, you know, have enough money to because in, in, in minor league baseball, um, for listeners that don't understand, you know, you're you're making, you know, a couple of thousand dollars before taxes, you know, in the minor leagues for just the month, just the months that you play. I mean, and that's kind of where I was. I was trying to make it back as a knuckleball pitcher, um, having been a conventional pitcher for the first 10 years of my career. And, you know, I had struggled to a modicum of success in 07 when I was with the Nashville Sounds. And then in 08, I was with the Mariners. And I was kind of getting a cup of coffee and I was, I was felt like God wanted me to I, tell my story. And, and he had, he had started to give me the equipment from 05 to 08 and working with Steven to be able to do that. And I felt like it was time to share. So I wrote, started writing that book in 08, but when it got to my sexual abuse, I couldn't do it. Like I had to put it, I had to put it down. So the miracle in all this is when I signed with the Mets in 2010, um, the I didn't know what to expect. You know, I read an article one time that I'll never forget said, uh, from a Mets publication that said, you know, what are we doing signing R.A. Dickey? We're picking up people off the scrap heap of, uh, you know, and it just it kind of resonated with some of the things I'd really struggled with, um, you know, shame filled things kind of before I started doing work on myself and. Uh, I, you know, coincidentally in 10, in 10, you know, I, I felt like it was time for me to try to start writing about my abuse. And I knew if I wrote, wrote a book, Jason, that I couldn't, in order to connect with people, in order to sit with people in their pain, I, I couldn't tiptoe around what was hard. And so I knew if I wrote a book that I wanted to write, and I was an English major in, at Tennessee and really enjoyed the written word. So I had an idea how to sculpt it, but in 10, I started writing about it and I was able to do it in a new way. And, 
and it took me, you know, the all season, uh, 10 going into 11, um, where I got with, a an, a writing agent and then a public, a public, a publisher, and then a ghost writer and Wayne coffee, who was a real friend, dear friend of mine. And we, we wrote the book, but I, I didn't have, you know, I was writing it at a time when I could have just been, I could have gone, I could have stayed in the minor leagues in, at Buffalo and bounced around my whole career. So the, the real miracle is that something happened in 2010 where I threw a, a game in uh, Buffalo against, I think it was the Durham Bulls. And I gave up a, a leadoff single to a little bleeder over the second baseman's head. And then I retired 27 hitters in a row and threw a one hitter and something happened in that game where I was like, I, I think I, I have something now that I can be a consistent like major league player with. Like I, I I've done enough work with the knuckleball now between Oh five and 10. So five years I've dedicated to the craft of trying to be a good knuckleball pitcher. I, I've, I've gotten the repetition down, the muscle memory down, whatever you want to say to be able to do it consistently. And ironically enough, I got called up like a week and a half later. And that was in 10. So as I was writing my, my book and as I was doing work on myself and as I was, um, you know, getting to a place where I felt good about writing about my abuse, I started having a lot of success at the, at the major league level after I got called up, wrote the book and throughout 11. And, and my, I had a good year in 2010, a really good year enough to come back in 2011 as, uh, as, probably the number two or three guy behind Johan Santana um, at, at the, in the Mets rotation. And so I came back in 11 and I was still writing the book and trying to figure all that out. And I ended up being like, I think I was like eight, 13 with a three, two ERA. So I pitched pretty good through 200 innings for the first time in my career. And so some good things were happening still at the major league level. Then um, they published the book. And it came out at the beginning of the 12 season. So the book coming out for the public to, to buy and read and, you know, critique and judge and all that happened spring training of, of 2012. And so for the book to come out in the Cy Young year where it was going to have the best chance of being picked up and read was was no more than a major miracle, you know, for me. Like I saw that clearly as that, as that kind of timeline unfolded and God was reminding me daily, Hey, this is not about your baseball. Like, this is not like your, your back to back one hitters, your whatever else that's, it's not about your baseball. And I had to keep reminding myself that it wasn't about my baseball because it was, that's what I wanted to believe. I wanted to believe that, Oh, I've achieved this now. And you know, I sh- this should be happening. I put in so much work. This is, this is just, you know, it's right. It's just, it's fair. It's blah, blah, blah. Like that's the enemy was attacking me in that moment and a bunch of subsequent moments after that with that. And so I, good friends and Steven and others were reminding me, Hey, look, dude, this isn't about baseball. This is about something so much better and more eternal and that will outlast your career, you know? And so you need to understand that to keep holding it lightly, like to keep holding baseball lightly. And so that it took that to remind me of that, you know, and that was so helpful. And so that was kind of an answer to your question. That was a kind of a roundabout way of getting there. But um, yes, I was aware and others were aware that God was putting together kind of a mosaic Um, in order to put the book in as many people's hands as possible. And, and, you know, thankfully it ended up being a New York times bestseller and that's, you know, people are still asking me to share about it. And and I have a, a a platform now post baseball to be able to talk about Jesus and share my, my story with in a way that I hope is encouraging. He is R.A. Dickey, longtime Major League Baseball pitcher, 2012 NL Cy Young Award winner, 
2012 All-Star NL Strikeout Leader, 2013 Gold Glove Winner. Listen, this has been awesome, R.A., and, and you know what? We... We didn't even get a chance to talk about our mutual love for Star Wars. We'll have to save that for another time, of course. But it's been really great to hear your story and just grateful and thankful to you uh, for taking the time to join us here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Uh, Thank you, and we'll hopefully catch up with you again soon. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much. And we're truly thankful to R.A. Dickey, longtime Major League Baseball pitcher, 2012 National League Cy Young Award winner, for joining us here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast podcast his book again released in 2012 but a really good read and worth going back and look at it's called wherever i wind up my quest for truth authenticity and the perfect knuckleball it's available on amazon and everywhere books are found and so we thank ra for joining us here on the podcast we also thank you for listening and we thank compassion international for being a sponsor with the sports spectrum podcast go to compassion.com slash sports spectrum 38 dollars a month change a child's life. I mean, that's what we all are called on this earth to do is to give back and to serve others. And this is a way to give back to the least of these and to impact a child's life. We're talking about food, education, medical training, everything that is needed in a child's life to provide them with hope and a future. That's what compassion does. And that's what you can do, making an impact on their life for just $38 a month. Go to compassion.com slash sports spectrum and sponsor a child today. Thanks so much for joining us here on the podcast. Reach us via email, as always, jason at sportspectrum.com. And if you like this interview with R.A. Dickey, maybe take a screenshot of it uh, and, and share it. Share it on your Twitter page, your Facebook page, your Instagram page. Let people know about the intersection of sports and faith and the stories that we're telling here on the Sports Spectrum podcast. And as always, follow us over at Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, like our YouTube channel, and check out all of our content, including a daily devotional over at sportspectrum.com. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a great rest of your day. We'll see you next time right here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Have a good one.